Thank you for joining us in these important conversations. A friend once told me, it's hard work, but it's heart work. Diversity is having a seat at the table. Inclusion is having a voice. Belonging is having that voice be heard. What is color? What is race? Would you like me better if we had the same thing? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of every people, race, and culture, we rejoice in the wonderful diversity of our human family, each person made in your own image. As we observe Black History Month this February, Help us to honour and learn from the history of Black communities across Canada. To stand in solidarity with them in their quest for justice and respect. And to work together toward a future where every person is cherished, where everyone's dignity is upheld. Where racism and discrimination still linger, change our hearts and show us how to love like you. We praise you, God, through Jesus, your Son, in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Hi, I'm Mayor Jeff Lehman. I want to say a word about equity and diversity in Barrie, but first, today, I want to thank the organizers of Diverse Voices Unite for once again being a big part of Black History Month here in the city of Barrie, and to thank everyone at St. Peter's for your contributions. Um, You know, I think this event, uh, bringing together performing artists, students, community partners and others to talk about Canadian Black history, uh, so important um, that we have a diversity of voices uh, as we hear about uh, Canadian Black history and as we bring that uh, understanding in history, which has not uh, had enough opportunities, enough platforms to, to be brought to a broader audience here in our community. Another woman I respect a great deal, Shaq Edwards, the founders, founder of Shaq's World here in Barrie. Uh, so thank you again to everybody organizing Diverse Voices Unite as part of Black History Month here in Barrie. You can uh, find more details about Black History Month in Barrie at barrie.ca in terms of the list of events that are going on. And at this, this time, especially uh, after a a couple of years when uh, it has been harder and harder to build unity in a community, to build understanding uh, and to create opportunity for more exchange of, of views and understandings among diverse populations. You know, it's particularly important this year after, uh, you know, a year of COVID when we've been online, when we've been shut in, when many of us have been isolated more than usual, to have events like this where we can speak to each other about the change in our community, uh, where we can learn uh, from diverse voices in our community. And uh, it is so important, I think, particularly here in 2022, that we continue to grow events like this. So thank you to the organizers. Uh, I hope you get the chance to um, to, to be part of all, a number of events uh, during Black History Month, and thank you for your contributions towards more diversity and equity in our community. Yeah. The education system, or like the school systems, um, even in the government, like I feel there isn't enough diversity. And I joined because I feel like diversity is something that needs to be talked about more, especially in schools and classrooms. And I also feel like diversity builds up a community, which is something we need to talk about. Well, that's another thing, like representation on a small and large scale, large scale being celebrities, politicians, people that do the things that we want to do, like Uh, athletes, any like dreams that we have, if you're not getting representation, like you kind of feel like there's no place in that for you.
what it is, y'all. Yeah, what it is, y'all. That's the universal question. We just seek the answers. Picture the world with me. This is what I see. Justice, equality, racial harmony. What can one person do? I'm one you made to. I will stand with you. Together we are better. What is color? What is race? Would you like me better if we had the same face? My blood be red, my heart beats too. With so much love, my brother for you. What is color? What is race? Would you like me better if we had the same face? My blood be red. My heart beats true With so much love My sister for you Picture the world with me This is what I see No war, no poverty And no culture harmony I heard one person say Love will make the way For peace and equality This encourages me what is color? What is race? Would you like me better if we had the same face? My blood needs red, my heart beats too. With so much love, my brother for you. What is color? What is race? Would you like me better? We had the same face. My blood bleeds red, my heart beats too. With so much love, my sister for you. Yeah, yeah, we thinking globally, we acting locally, and won't somebody tell me what it is? Yo, practice life that does not bend, but if you bend your mind, you might just find a friend. What is color? What is race? Would you like me better if we had the same face? My blood beats red, my heart beats too. With so much love, my brother for you. What is color? What is race? Would you like me better if we had the same face? My blood bleeds red, my heart bleeds too. With so much love, my sister for you. So without further ado, I just want to introduce our special guest, Shannon. She's the Vice President of the Ontario Black History Society. She is a historical consultant, an author, a podcaster, and a speaker. I am so pleased to be a part of this year's Diverse Voices program. It is my honor to teach and educate about Black Canadian history, and it is a privilege for me to be the Vice President of the Ontario Black History Society, where we promote, celebrate, and raise awareness about Black history in Ontario and across Canada. At the Ontario Black History Society, it is one of our goals to see Black history in Canada and Ontario taught throughout the schools and, and just taught throughout the country. As we celebrate 26 years of Black History Month in Canada, it is important to remember that Black history is Canadian history, and we should all endeavor to learn more about this beautiful, diverse 400-year history in Canada, not only in February, but throughout the rest of the year. Happy Black History Month to all. It's nice to meet everyone. I'm so happy to meet you and hear about all the work that you guys are doing and really proud that you're taking the stand um, in high school and it can only go up from here. So 
keep doing what you're doing. It's really, really amazing work. So I was just wondering what the origin of OBHS is. Yes, yeah, so the Ontario Black History Society, um, I'm the vice president there and I have been for the past, oh, almost five years. Um, so Dr. Daniel Hill, Donna Hill, his wife, Wilson Brooks, Joan Kazmarski, Lauren Hubbard, and a few others uh, co-founded the Ontario Black History Society all the way back in 1978. It became the first public um, organization in Canada that was really focused and still is focused on the history of Black people in this country. Um, Dr. Daniel Hill, he remained the president for six years, uh, you know, starting in 1978. And our organization, we're at the forefront, as I said, of promoting, preserving, and studying Black history in Ontario, as well as Canada on a whole. Um, so we have a few accomplishments. We help to, um, you know, get um, recognized as a heritage organization. We help to get Black History Month celebrated and recognized across all levels of government. And um, we had the help, the gracious help of Dr. Jean Augustine, who was the first Black woman to be a member of parliament. And she helped to bring the motion of Black History Month um, to the House of Commons, and it was passed in December of 1995. And in 1996, we celebrated the first Black History Month in Canada. And we're celebrating 26 years, starting in just a few days. Tell us about your podcast work and kind of like how it affects the community. Sure, yeah. So my podcast is called Black to Canada. Um, I actually launched it uh, on my birthday last year in 2021, January 4th, was the first kind of intro introduction uh, episode. Uh, but the podcast actually started um, as a result. So I'm, I'm doing my PhD right now. And part of one of my classes was to do an assignment and I, we had creative reign. So I'm like, hmm, let me do a podcast. Um, podcasting and vlogs and thing, video logs were kind of in my head for a few years, um, but life got busy and I had to kind of leave that idea. So when I got the opportunity to do an assignment and introduce something creative, I'm like, hmm, let's bring back up this, you know, video podcasting. Um, so it started there and I just decided to continue on. And um, I'm just passionate about sharing um, Black history in Canada, the over 400 years of Black history that we have, or history, I should say, in this country. Um, so yeah, I launched it last year. We're in season two. It, um, a new episode drops every other Monday and almost at the end of season two. And I really just want to uh, provide listeners with uh, the diverse, rich history that Black people have in this country. So it's been interesting it's been a learning curve but most of all it's been fun and um, i love just documenting our stories in this way what are some key canadian black history facts that you would like our students in st peter's to know sure oh there are so many as i said we have over 400 years worth of history but i'll just list a few here um so if you do know you may not know nova scotia one of our provinces is kind of at the epicenter of Black history in this country. So the first Black History Month uh, in Nova Scotia was observed in 1988, and it later was renamed to African Heritage Month in 1996. So that's one key fact I want us to know. Uh, in 2008, in February specifically, Senator Donald Oliver, he was the first Black man appointed to the Canadian Senate. He introduced a motion to recognize the contributions of Black Canadians and February's Black History Month, and it received unanimous approval and was adopted on March 4th, 2008. Uh, the next fact I want us to kind of know about um, is that North America's first race riot happened right here in Canada, again in Nova Scotia. Um, so around the time of the American Revolution, the British offered um, escaped enslaved people land in Canada, in Nova Scotia, um, if they fought for their side. And uh, because of this, roughly 10,000 Black loyalists, as they were called, fought for Britain and were sent to Nova Scotia after the British lost the war. Now, you know, 
yes, black enslaved people who are black loyalists who fought for the British, they received their freedom and they re received land in Nova Scotia, but problems arise that didn't take away the fact that there was racism and discrimination and prejudice. So problems began to arise, tensions started to bubble over with the free black loyalists um, in a town called Birchtown, which is still there in Nova Scotia today. Um, and the white community of Shelburne. So Shelburne and Birchtown are really close together in Nova Scotia. Um, so in 1784, 40 white loyalists, um, white, yeah, white loyalists broke into the house of a man named David George, a black man. He was a preacher and broke into 20 other homes and incited uh, the first race riot. And this actually went on for 10 days. So there's a bit of jealousy and tension. Um, white loyalists weren't happy that these black people were, you know, working and trying to make a life for themselves. So first race riot happened in Birchtown, Nova Scotia. Um, the last, well, second to last uh, fact um, is about the community of Hogan's Alley. Uh, it's a community uh, or was a community in Vancouver's East End. And it had a lot of uh, black immigrants come to the area. It was considered, again, one of the first black communities in Vancouver. Many other immigrants came to the area. However, the community didn't last long because uh, the city of uh, Vancouver wanted to build like a viaduct and, you know, tore down the, the community. So that's an important, there's a lot of black history across the country, but particularly in Vancouver, Hogan's Alley is very important as well. And the last fact, there's so many that I could list, but I'll just do five as I'm doing, um, is that the province of Ontario took major steps in 1944 um, to pass uh, the Racial Discrimination Act. And this act meant that it was illegal to place discriminatory public signages, newspaper notices, and radio broadcast, broadcasts. Um, and shortly afterwards, Ontario passed more laws on discrimination, uh, like the Fair Employment Practices Act, and that was in 1951, and the Fair Accommodation Practices Act, 1954. And these acts um, combined to create the Ontario Human Rights right Code, which we still have now and, and still observe now. So um, those are some five, you know, five facts that I wanted to share with uh, you guys and, and with your the rest of your classmates. What do you believe needs to change in education in regards to addressing Canadian Black history and equity for all? So the major thing, um, as I mentioned before, is that Black history, um, anti-oppression, anti-Black racism, all of that needs to be taught in schools. It needs to be a part of the curriculum. Um, throughout the year. It just needs to be part of the curriculum. And that's one thing, as I mentioned, that the Ontario Black History Society is doing. We're trying to really put pressure on the government to um, get Black history mandated in the curriculum. That's the most important thing. It starts when we're young, right? When we're in school. If we learn about different people and different cultures and the history of this country, I think um, it will help a lot, um, you know, in the future. So that's the major thing. Black history, all of these topics um, have to be in the curriculum, and unfortunately, they're not. So we keep working towards that. Um, I'm sure you're aware um, of the issues occurring in schools surrounding um, the regards in addressing anti-Black racism. So what do you think educators can do to improve their practices in regards to addressing anti-Black racism? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Uh, first and foremost, as I said, just, you know, February is wonderful. We appreciate Black History Month. We appreciate all those who fought to get it implemented. But Black history is Canadian history, and it should be taught throughout the year. So educators, I know, you know, sometimes face pressure to kind of stick to the curriculum and kind of get everything covered. But there are so many different ways that, you know, they can incorporate Black history throughout the year. Um, and to be creative with it too, whether it's a podcast or watching a documentary or having a speaker come in or anything like that. There's so many different creative ways that educators can make it fun learning for students um, to teach about Black history throughout the year. Um, and yeah, there's, there's lots to be done, but um, I think just observing and teaching Black history 
365 whenever there's an opportunity is is the best way to go. Shannon, I just want to say thank you so much. Oh, my I, pleasure. All thanks, right, Shannon. You're welcome. Bless you. Bless Heron and everyone at St. Peter's for once again inviting me to be part of this important recognition of Black History Month in Simcoe County. During Black History Month, people in Canada celebrate the many achievements and contributions of Black Canadians in their communities who throughout history have done so much to make Canada the culturally diverse, compassionate and prosperous nation it is today. In December 1995, the House of Commons officially recognized February as Black History Month in Canada following a motion introduced by Dr. Jean Augustine. The House of Commons carried the motion unanimously. And in February 2008, Senator Donald Oliver, the first black man appointed to the Senate, introduced the motion to recognize contributions of black Canadians and February as Black History Month. It also received unanimous approval and was adopted on March 4, 2008. The adoption of this motion completed Canada's parliamentary position on Black History Month. For me, Black History Month is a time of reflection and a time to be thankful for the contributions black Canadians have made to our community of Barrie Innisfil, across Simcoe County, and our beautifully diverse country of Canada. It's also a time to celebrate resilience, innovation, and determination while working towards a more inclusive and diverse Canada. A Canada in which everyone has every opportunity to flourish and succeed. In my role as the Member of Parliament for Barry Innisville, I'm committed to building the bridges that bring our growing and diverse communities together, and I know that you are too. Thank you again for inviting me to speak, and happy Black History Month, everyone. racism sadly is, is that it does exist um, and it, it always has existed um, and if obviously we want all the students at the school to feel equality exists here in our building and I think that we try our best to always provide that and opportunities for all of our students to be successful I mean that being said I really feel that uh, we can still improve greatly uh, which is why I think that the Black History Month is going to be so successful this year. We've got a really strong group of students that are advocating. And with everything going on right now in the world, um, we have uh, some unlearning to do and relearning, and uh, and that's just all part of it. So I feel like if we go into it with an open mind, that anything is really possible. Yes, love that. Okay, um, and next question. What stereotypes do you feel exist in our school to bring Um. So I, I don't really, I mean, I guess I don't really understand a lot of stereotypes because I mean, where I came from, I'm a white middle-class uh, woman. I grew up in a very middle-class community um, that didn't have a lot of uh, racial ethnicity and not a lot of diversity and from Sault Ste. Marie, so a very small Northern community. Um, but again, I know that uh, like, I feel like if you ask somebody who might have been stereotyped against um, or who would have been prejudiced against. I feel like if you ask them, it could just be as simple as like somebody in a class saying something to them. It could be as big as not being included because of your color or because of what your beliefs are. Um, and I know that it exists in, in the building. I really do. And I feel like we need to do better and opening up these conversations to it and having students talk about it and like you know you're the face the front line you know what it's all about and you are going to educate me 
and our community um, about your experiences and talking about it and listening to the stories that everybody has uh, been involved in is, I think, what really helps everybody to understand what it would feel like to be stereotyped against and what it feels like to have a, pre a prejudice. Um, and, and I just feel that moving forward, that education is what will be key in helping us here at St. Peter's especially. And I know in very, there's a huge community willing to learn and, uh, and to make sure that we're taking all of our opportunities to listen to our students and, uh, and making that culture a, a lot more visible here in our building and in the community. I unfortunately don't know that much about the Canadian Black history, but I'm willing to learn more about it. I don't really know a lot about Canadian Black history, but I really want to learn more. The first word we think of when you think of Black History Month or culture in general, what's like one yeah. word you think of? I think my word would be rich because like when I think of that, I immediately think of like chocolate, like dark chocolate. And I think it's so interesting because some people would think of rich as like money, economic status. But I think like the best types of people are the people that can find richness in culture or love or family. So I think that's like an amazing thing about my culture and Black History Month in general. It's such a time of unity. For me, it would be appreciative because I Talking about Black History Month and just the month of February makes me appreciative of who I am and just learning more about my culture and how my culture helped build Canada where it is today. Um, I believe talking about not just Black history in general, but um, different cultures and religions and races and backgrounds, I believe it's really important uh, for people to get educated about them because it, it's even fun learning about different religions and races. Each February, Black History Month is an opportunity in Canada and here locally to honor Black Canadians who have contributed immeasurably to the successes and dreams of our country. Black history has created a foundation for our country and that foundation extends into our community in many ways. One prominent example is the Oro African Methodist Episcopal Church, a church built by African Canadians which is now designated as a National Historic Site of Canada. The church represents the important role that black militiamen played in the, in the defense of Upper Canada during the War of 1812. It is a true testament of the sacrifices made by those black militiamen who served to defend our rights and freedoms which are now carried out in the Canadian Constitution. Black leaders continue to contribute to our community each and every day and for that I am thankful. I am honoured to participate in the Diverse Voices United 2022 event and encourage all Canadians to engage with, learn about, share and celebrate this vibrant part of our heritage this month and every month.
of kindness. Staying humble and kind through Black History Month is extremely important for you to learn, for you to grow as young people. It's important that you're always open to the experiences of others, the experiences of the people around you. So this Black History Month, I encourage you to be kind to the people around you and have conversations that are nothing but positive and enlightening. art room so typically in our art room we'll do things like our art for the soul program so our art for the soul program is um, dedicated to youth that are interested in um, expressing themselves through art so this is a great way for to find emotional regulation through art but we also do a lot of mentoring and we've got if you want to pan over to these rocking horses some awesome local artists have come in and done these rocking horses for us and we will be donating them to the women and children shelter so that they can each have a custom piece of art from our beautiful local artists. Cool. The idea behind this is to just put what uh, what important things we've got coming up, events. We are huge on community initiatives, so by having this, we can usually say who we're partnered with and give you a little bit of a, a quote to live by. The last thing we had on here was our grand opening. Hopefully, we have another big event coming up soon. Cool. So I'll take you this way to my favorite room. Is that the court? Oh, you know that it is. <laughs> Welcome. So this is the Shaxx World Gym. Uh, in this gym, we do lots of physical activity. We are classified as a youth mental and physical wellness facility. So in here, we do things like strength and conditioning training, basketball training, soccer, wrestling, dance. Um, and we really get to what I feel is connect with the youth of our community. You know, we're not in an institution where we're sitting down and talking across the table. We're playing basketball. We're really connecting. So this is my favorite room. It gets people moving and it gets them connected and having conversations. Do you think that like basketball was your inspiration for the entirety of the youth center? Is this where like you kind of started having a sports center? I think this is where it started. I absolutely believe that uh, basketball is the heart of what I do, um, but I have a passion for helping youth with their mental health, helping them find resources, and inspiring them to be great. So it started there, but it's so much bigger than basketball. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't have called this my favorite room in the, in the facility because they're all my favorite rooms. So this is another one of my favorite rooms. This is our youth hangout area. So typically on a regular day, you'll see youth using this uh, couches here, just hanging out, charging their phones, their laptops, doing homework. Uh, we've got board games, card games. So there's a lot of laughter in here. I always hear the foosball table and the air hockey machine going off. So I know stuff is happening. <laughs> um, and the mural. So look at this wall. Lots of possibilities. Lots of possibility for this wall. 
We painted that white um, because we want to put youth hangout up there. So even having someone come in and paint youth hangout up there would be awesome. So uh, during the day, we have programs with developmentally delayed youth that happen here. So we do a lot of cooking and nutrition with them in the kitchen. Um, we hope to offer that to youth in the community soon on how to grocery shop and cook on a budget and make it healthy. So this kitchen will be utilized soon. Um, one of the other things is we got this counter redone and lowered. Shaq's World came from, I think, a place of wanting to create a safe space for young people. I had a hard time growing up finding a space where I felt like I could be myself 100%. I had a hard time anywhere outside of basketball, really. So Shaq's World, the community center, came from wanting to create a safe space for all youth. And how do you feel that that's like impacted the community, like the ripple effect? Because it is Shaq's world. So like, it's an honor to be able to put your name on something like that. I think that I, most recently I saw the best ripple, ripple effect I could have seen. And there's a young boy in one of our basketball programs and he's full of life, you know, he's his, he's his own character. And I think that we've really been able to harness that for him. So he created an Instagram page the other day and he followed our Instagram page and his Instagram page is called his name world. And I got so overjoyed because that's the space we're trying to create where youth feel like they can create their own worlds and they can be authentic as well. So the ripple effect is seeing them start to shine on their own and start to create foundations on their own. I think that the best way to nurture something like this, and I've said it a million times, I feel, is it takes a community and it's on our website. It takes a village to raise a child and a community to raise a teenager. And I really believe that hand in hand by giving them access to these resources and eliminating all of the different barriers that young people face, that is how you can make a difference. That is how you can be a part of the bigger change. So you've got options like monthly donations. You can even purchase our clothing and something like that goes a long way for someone that may need subsidy for one of our programs. So I think those are great ways to get involved. And even on a smaller scale, follow us on socials, share our posts, talk about what we're doing here, get the word out there. Word of mouth is very powerful. So since we're coming from St. Pete's, we know you guys have a sponsorship together and tell us about that. So last year, I was approached by the uh, Catholic School Board and St. Pete's was one of the very first schools that I was able to do a presentation for. And since then, St. Pete's staff, I believe, have purchased 10 sweaters, maybe more. Um, so they're all rocking the Shaq's World gear, as well as you have the opportunity to go to your principal and ask for a membership. Um, and with that, it's subsidized by your school and you can come down, hang out with us, shoot around, and participate in any one of of our drop-in programs for free. There are other coaches that coach the teams. We have a dedicated personal trainer and dedicated academic advisor for the boys so that they're on track. We want to get all of them into prep school or post-secondary eventually. So that's what Hoops Plus is about. And what challenges have you faced as a black business owner? Um, I would say that some of the more dominant challenges that I face are people having a hard time separating my business from me as an individual. Our vision and our mission here at Shaq's World is so big, it's so broad, um, that I find that a lot of people see the owner or the president of the organization and assume things that don't line up with our narrative, uh, for example. A lot of people know me from the BLM rallies from 2020, the summer of 2020, during an extremely sensitive time socially. And um, when opening the facility, a lot of people were under the idea that it was only going to be for black youth. That came from me being a black woman, not because I ever said it. I never once said that the space was going to be for black youth only, but unfortunately that was what was stuck on the organization. So. That has been a challenge, but I do 
think that over the past uh, year and a half, we've been able to change that narrative a little bit um, to create more of a safe space for youth. And we have a great diverse group of families, organizations, and business owners that now utilize Shaq's World. So was it a challenge? Yes. Is it a challenge now? Not really. We have a beautiful community here. So thanks for coming, guys. Um, and again, I'm Shaq of Shaq's World. Come down and visit. Uh, we're always here having uncomfortable conversations 365 days a year. So I encourage you guys to come visit us anytime. Bye, guys. Yeah. Oh, there's so a bunch of stereotypes in this school. All right, so since I'm like an athlete, right? We got everybody here. Like, if I, they, they suck at the sport, they'd be like, oh, it's because they're black. That's why you're better than me. No, honestly, this school, it feels like there's just like a handful of people that are like the same race as me. And especially like months like Black History Month, I don't feel like we talk about it enough or like our, my, you know, my culture is represented enough in the school. Um, what are some perceptions you've noticed? Um, I think that some people believe that like like black people or like people of color like say like act a certain way because they are their color like oh black girls act ratchet or whatever in like in the school community when it's not true at all. Um, it's never really been equal in our society but our society has been trying to make it equal, but it still isn't, even though we put more of a stress on it, but uh, it's better than what it used to be, but it still isn't equal. Is there any situation that you guys would like to kind of speak on or anything that you feel that teachers or you would like to see other students be doing? Uh, definitely, like, when the topic is brought up and it's spoken about like there's always that one person that yeah. just stares at you yeah it's like, <laughs> like why are you staring yeah it's just uncomfortable and i want to feel comfortable in the classroom setting i don't want to feel like i'm wary about my peers and just my environment and it's like how should i act or should i be myself yeah, yeah. exactly the same situation for me like if we're watching or if we're ever watching a documentary on like the Canadian Railroad or how the slaves like uh, commuted from the US to Canada or like anything to do with black lives like I like Howie Sosa said I want to feel comfortable I don't want it to be awkward or like oh look we're your ancestors <laughs> slaves yeah. or like anything like that it, and we're not we're not putting like pressure on anyone obviously um, we just want everyone to have a safe um, and comfortable environment talking about this sensitive topic. Yeah. yeah, and like, I think the attention towards people of color in the classroom is like, the like it's a really good thought process. I just think that like, pulling people out of class, talking to them separately, looking at them, like just kind of making sure everybody knows that this conversation is directed towards someone kind of does the wrong thing and has like a negative reaction to something I believe that they didn't want. And I think a lot of students don't say it because they rather just um, go towards other people. Like if I'd ever been in a class, I would probably just go to another person that I feel like is going through the same experience and talk to them about it. And maybe I should have talked to the teacher about it personally, and that would have been more effective. I just think that we kind of gravitate towards each other because on social media, I've seen lots of people saying exactly what you said. As soon as a documentary comes up, everyone, turns their head and it's like uh it's a little bit uncomfortable but you just kind of talk to whoever you think will understand you mm -hmm. and maybe we should start talking about it more in public because maybe teachers just and all staff just don't know fully yeah. Yeah. hello st peter's school students it's andrea kanjan here your member of provincial parliament for barry innisville Thank you for allowing me to address you as you learn about diverse voices. Our education system is a great example of how we embrace diversity. After all, it's a place of equal opportunity. No matter where you came from or the color of your skin, you too have equal opportunity to achieve your greatest potentials and your dreams and whatever career opportunities are there before you. 
Here in Simcoe County, we have excellent history when it comes to Black History Month. For example, it was the Black community that fought alongside Canadian soldiers in World War II, and to thank them, they received land in Oro Bonante, which you can still visit to this day at one of the Oro churches. In addition to that, most recent history, this past year, a group of individuals came together to launch what's called the Semba Awards to recognize a black excellence in the business community and those who help diversify in their particular business. In addition to that, the province has laid out its also anti-black racism directorate. And through that directorate, they have a strategic plan that works in all levels of government in order to eradicate racism throughout government policies. And one more interesting fact, in Ontario, we had our first black lieutenant governor in Ontario. But I'm not gonna tell you who that is, because I'm gonna give you a little bit of homework to take that away so you can find out more about your Ontario history. Thank you. Yeah. Two times, I. stereotypes based on uh, religion, class, uh, race. Um, I think all of those stereotypes, unfortunately, are probably evident in our schools and in our communities. The next question I have is, have you ever witnessed someone justify their racism? Um, I think so, yes, and certainly in conversation, maybe with friends, family, or even with students. And I think the hard part is, when you recognize maybe someone has an opinion that's very, very different from yours, I think the important thing is not to try to change necessarily their opinion, but hopefully express to them so that they can learn on their own. 
um, because forcing your beliefs, I find, doesn't work. But bringing a new understanding um, can be a lot more fruitful. I think in regards to other students or other teachers incorporating this or involving this when they are discussing these topics is probably A, because maybe there's a lack of understanding especially when it comes to stereotypes, prejudice, discrimination, when there is a lack of understanding, perhaps we don't feel confident or comfortable in our responses or how we want to respond. And maybe even to bring comfort in how perhaps they want to see their responses as well. Um, but I truly think just if there's a lack of understanding or um, even just the possibility of um, being scared as well with the circumstances of how to respond. What's the good way to respond here? So I think that could possibly why. I think the difference is appreciating another culture versus trying to act like a culture you're not, which come, which is not a good thing to do because it discredits that culture. Cultural appreciation is when you take the time to like research and learn a culture and like actually understand why people do these things and like you learn it for yourself and you do it and appreciate it. And cultural appropriation is where you don't understand anything and you're just doing it. Like as people in Halloween, people would wear like native indigenous like headdresses and stuff as a costume when really it's not a costume, they're, they're, they're culture and they are people. You know, that's appropriation. Yes, uh, mostly in so social situations when they're trying to talk negatively about black students. Uh, it makes me feel uncomfortable. It makes me feel not very uh, welcome in that circle. And I think that um, there should be people that are designated to support teachers when addressing any sort of like social justice issue, any indigenous issue. There's just so much more diversity coming into our city and our school specifically. And I've seen lots of people that identify all over the board and it's it's amazing to see, but we also wanna make sure that they feel comfortable here. Yeah, I, I, I feel it was difficult for me to adjust too, cause I was a bit younger. So I was like, okay, like there's not that many like people that have the same skin color as me, but then I just like, hmm. you know, so it, yeah, it was, it was tough, but, um, and then I, yeah, so and then I finally started to adjust and I found friends that actually like um, understood me and like the the problems that I was having, like yeah. even in, in a diverse community, like still. Um, never be afraid to ask questions, like unanswered questions, because we all are still learning about new stuff and like, it's okay, like, if you don't know a lot of things, it's fine. Like, we can answer questions, you can use Google, mm -hmm. anything. Yeah, Google works. Special thanks to Serena Stodart and Jamie Turner, the City of Barrie and Rogers Television. Special thanks to the St. Peter's community, DVU team, Shannon Oyana Ran and Shaq Edwards, political dignitaries and artistic performers. See you next year hopefully live in person for Diverse Voices Unite.
Good evening, and welcome to Diverse Voices Unite 2022. My name is Manon Heron, and I'll be your host this evening. Tonight, we're going to continue the conversations. Here tonight are special guests, Shannon Oyanaran, the Vice President on the Ontario Black History Society in Toronto, Shaq Edwards, the founder of Shaq's World in Barrie, Errol Lee, local artist and founder of Caring Concerts, Micah Lee, his son and the event artistic producer. And from St. Peter's, we have Serena Stodart, our event video producer, and some of the Diverse Voices Unite team, Aminara Yula, Isiosa Abu, Tiara Heath, Madison Dieselmeyer, Franz Galila, and Kaylee Hamilton. I hope everyone's doing well tonight and let our conversations begin. Shannon, how are you doing tonight? I am so well. Thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. So wonderful to be here. Awesome. So you are preparing for your PhD dissertation and you lead podcasts that are all about Canadian Black history and anti-Black racism. What is essential that Canadians know about our Black history and how can we move forward without racial injustice? Yes. Yeah, so with my PhD work and my podcast, Black to Canada, and just with all the work that I do, I really want people to understand and learn about Black Canadian history and really know that there's over 400 years of Black history in Canada. There are beautiful, amazing stories of Black Canadians, some that haven't been told. And um, I'm just really trying to get that information out there to all Canadians and to anyone who will listen. I just think, um, you know, our history is so important and it's always best to look back because we know that history dictates our present and our future. So I really just want to, yeah, and whatever I do, if I'm writing a book or podcast, my PhD work, speaking engagements, whatever it is, I just really want to educate people about the rich over 400 year history of Black uh, people in this country. Thank you so much. I, I love that you're doing all of that work. Um, Shaq Edwards, how are you doing this evening? Hello, Manon. It's so wonderful to see you and everyone else. Thank you for having me tonight. So Shaq, you continue to be a role model, innovator, and entrepreneur, and you are a voice for awareness and change. What is your mission at Shaq's World, and what are some of the misconceptions that people have about Shaq's World? So our mission at Shaq's World is to create respectful, successful athletes and community members all through sports, mentorship and community engagement. Uh, with the community center here, Shaq's World Community Center was built to tackle the underlying issues behind mental health, homelessness and addiction um, that we find here in Simcoe County. So that's what the facility and Shaq's World are focused on. Um, one of the common misconceptions that we face is that Shaq's World is only for Black youth. Um, for some odd reason, when people here at risk, they automatically go to Black youth. Um, we are an at-risk youth centre, but the majority of our demographic does not come from the BIPOC community. So that is a misconception that we have, as well as people thinking that because our organization is creating a safe space for BIPOC individuals, that it is only for those individuals, which is incorrect. We are trying to create a space to have uncomfortable conversations all the time, and that means having all diversity under the same roof to have that conversation. So that's something that we've uh, struggled with. That's a narrative that we actively work to shift because we do want to see more community members in, in our space, so. Thank you for sharing that. I was just at your facility um, at Shaq's World last week and I was blown away with how many people were there, all different ages, all different, like from so much diversity. It was amazing. And I just, I felt the energy and it, it's amazing what you're doing. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. <laughs> Serena, the event producer, video producer, how are you tonight? I'm doing great. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. That's awesome. So let me ask you this. It's a loaded question. <laughs> um, what was it like to put this video together? 
Um, so many things, but I, I definitely think it was exciting and new. Those are the two words that can summarize it. I felt the responsibility to do this for multiple communities, especially for BIPOC community, for my school community. I felt a responsibility for me to be a leader in my school and spread this message. And I feel like I really am fulfilled by what I have done and created. It was a lot of stress, wasn't it, at the 11th hour? I didn't want to say that word, but it was a lot of stress. <laughs> okay, stress means it's like a heightened stimulation and things that you don't know are going to pop up tend to pop up. But we did it. You did it. I'm so proud of you as a grade 12 student. Yeah. And I hope that you take this learning and this journey with you forward and continue to do more projects like this. Thank you. Micah Lee, how are you doing tonight? I'm great, thank you. That's amazing. So what was it like to put all of the pieces of this virtual event together kind of at the last minute? <laughs> all the little last minute changes. Exciting is the word I'm gonna use. You know, never know what's gonna happen. Sometimes there's an issue that pops up but is easy to fix. Other times it looks like the video is wrong, but yeah, it's, it's always great to just see how things turn out. <laughs> And do you, did you take any courses to learn how to do what you do or it's just kind of experimental trial and error? So for me, it's been a lot of trial and error. I've gone to different places and kind of learned under people more experienced than me, just out of interest sake and people who have made themselves available to help grow me as a person. So it's really great to see that kind of community, even in Barrie, just to be able to ask people for a hand and they're teaching what they know which is amazing. It's thank you so much. Thank you for putting up with me as well. No problem. At least you smile there. I love that. Errol, how are you doing tonight? I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> I'm You're laughing. Kidding. You must be so proud of your son. I, oh my goodness. He did four concert presentations with me today. He was my on, um, in person producer handling running the show while I just do what's important to do so yeah the youth he, keep us yeah. calm don't they the youth keep <laughs> yeah. us calm especially when they know what they're doing <laughs> absolutely well Errol how do you um see the arts particularly the performing arts and yourself as change makers toward diversity and equity well the arts use the emotion to get to the brain right and when you say use the emotion that means it hits the heart first and if you want to change uh, people and uh, make a difference, you got to get to their heart and their mind. And so I use music and dance to as a method and the character as a message. And, and something that we all have in common here is when you hear people talk about who they are and what they're doing, there's some kind of character trait in there. You know, um, Shaq mentioned respectful, other people mentioned kind. And so to make a difference through the arts and character is what I do. Absolutely, I love it. And thank you for letting us use your music throughout the entire event. I love your songs. They're still playing in my head every day. Aw, <laughs> thanks, thank you. Absolutely. Awesome. Aminata, how are you? I'm doing good. That's awesome. So what was it like to be vulnerable during the St. Peter's podcast and all of these very important topics? Um, it was it was definitely a little hard opening up about my um, experiences like from the past, including my color or like the skin, uh, color of my skin. But I definitely felt comfortable after because I was around people that had the same and similar experiences to me. And I realized that um, those experience, those experiences helped other people see our, um, see our like, sorry, purpose. I but yeah, our purpose and like what we're what we're doing this group for and like how or sorry, um, um, yeah. So yeah, it was definitely it was a fun process uh, with Isosa and Serena, and I am very. I'm glad to be a part of the group. And yeah, thank you for sharing the experience with me. Ah, absolutely. I was so proud of you guys. I'd walk into the rehearsal studio and I would see you guys creating and discussing and it just made me so proud. 
Yeah, it was Being definitely so ner- a little nerve wracking too. But you know what? A little bit of nerves, that's what helps you grow. That means that yeah. you care. When you're nervous, it means that you care, right? Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Thank you. All right, Tiara, how are you this evening? I'm good. How are you? I am good. So what was it like to be interviewing all different people throughout the St. Peter's community? Um, It was very really interesting to view other people on this topic, to learn everybody's opinion on racism and how they encountered it and experienced it. And it was also nice to know that people would like to learn about the history behind this whole entire month and um, how they can educate themselves better towards racism. Excellent. Yeah, it's not easy to interview people sometimes, right? You have no. to really sometimes pull from people. Yeah. Did you find that a lot of people were very open to talking? Um, some, yes, but then there was other people that weren't didn't feel really comfortable about getting interviewed about racism. And maybe some of the people that we did interview, they would want to see the questions first to prepare themselves, which is understandable right? Because it's going to be posted. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Isyosa, how are you this this evening? I'm great. (laughs) You have a great smile tonight. (laughs) This is awesome. So Isyosa, what was it like to be vulnerable also on those podcasts? Um, It was very, it's kind of, To be vulnerable on the podcast, it was almost like a breath of fresh air in a way, because when talking about topics like this, you kind of keep to yourself because you never know like what someone would think or you have that feeling like, oh, they might not be able to relate to me. So you kind of feel like you can't open up and just speak your mind and say how you feel. But when I joined the Diverse Voices Unite group, I knew that there are people that have the same opinions and thoughts as me. And it's just so relaxing. And like I said, like a fresh breath of air to know that there's people that have the same values and beliefs as you and that you're able to open up and talk about many things that you've always wanted to speak about without being judged or persecuted or whatever. It's just, it feels like a very safe environment. That makes me really happy that you said that because a safe environment is the ideal environment to have those courageous conversations. And we went deep this year. We went deep. We talked about representation. You know, we didn't hide anything. We we were straight up. Uh, We talked about microaggressions. You know, we talked about what needs to change. And sometimes those are really difficult conversations because people like things to flow. People like things as status quo right? Because it's easy, it's relative, and we're used to it. It's very habitual. So when you kind of change things up and you change the conversations, people kind of wake up and go, oh, I never thought of it that way. So but we need you guys as the youth to open our eyes. Yeah, and the podcast was definitely inspirational and definitely an experience because when you open up and talk about things like this, maybe there's people out there in the school and the community that realize like, oh, I can speak on this topic too. Like you don't have to feel ashamed about what you stand up for. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Madison, how are you? Hi, I'm great. Thank you. That's amazing. So what was it like to put together our promo event poster? And what did you, like, what was important to you to make sure that you captured on that so people knew what our message was? Oh, well, creating it was a great opportunity to be active, like not only in the school community, I thought it was just for the school. And when I found out it was for the city of Barrie, that was like really great and nerve wracking because I obviously wanted to be good, but you also want people to be drawn to it and not just like another classroom poster. Um, I really tried to not only make it serious, but make it like fun and creative because Black History Month, it's not just about remember and honor, remembering and honoring the past, but also like celebrating the Black community and their stories. And people a lot of it is taken so seriously. And like what people were mentioning with the podcast, um, people are scared to talk about it because they think it's obviously this very serious topic, but they feel like they can't talk about the good things too. Um, because obviously when you're celebrating or like honoring history, um, there are a lot of bad things, but there's also a lot of good things to focus on too. And so when I was making the poster, I really wanted to 
bring that up. Thank you so much. No, I really appreciate that. Thank you, Franz. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. That's awesome. So what did you notice um, in some of the responses in the interviews? Were people really opening up? Were people a little closed off? Were people really camera shy? Like, what did you notice overall? Um, most of the people I asked are definitely camera shy. Like, they refuse to be on video. Um, but most of them were very observant of their surroundings and they're very aware of the racism that's like happening and you know all the stereotypical comments that are made around them with you know with their peers as well and I also really like the fact that so a lot of them admitted that they didn't know a thing or they didn't know a lot about Canadian Black history but then I was happy to hear that they were very willing to learn more about it or to continue learning. And that's important. That's why I'm so proud of the work of the Ontario Black History Society um, right now, and particularly the president as well, Natasha Henry, who's been really uh, trying to get the Ontario government to really change the curriculum to make sure that it's embedded right in the curriculum, because we know teachers are going to follow the plan. Um, and then when you have a plan, the professional development will come in. And then we will have those leaders coming into the schools and supporting because if there isn't that support, it's really difficult to feel confident aside from what you studied in university. You know, we all know our subject areas really well, but do we really know Canadian black history? Do we really know indigenous history? Do we really know Canadian history that's not in the books or what they want us to learn? And I think that's super important. So thank you, Franz, for making that really important observation. Thank you so much. Kaylee, how are you tonight? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? Good. So we have a we have quite a conversation that we're about to have right now because you were one of the dancers and yeah. Jamie Turner was the choreographer with Boomboxers Crew and he originally created the song To Changes by Tupac. And anybody watching tonight, I'm sure you know who Tupac is and I'm sure you know the song Changes, not if you know. Not if you know. Exactly. And so it ha it's, it's a very, um, it's a song that a lot of the youth connect with. It's a song that has lyrics that are really deep and straight up. There's no holes barred, as they say. However, it could be offensive to some, particularly even some of the older generations that maybe will have a stereotype of Black youth. Tupac speaks very clearly to youth, and that is why the youth feel very connected to song and dance, and they use lyrics like this to express themselves. So when we decided, Kaylee, to put this on the school YouTube, um, we decided to go instrumental because we wanted to avoid offending anybody, but we wanted people to assimilate and connect to say, hey, we still want you to think of what Tupac was trying to say. Exactly. But watch, everybody's going to look up changes. I'm telling you, there's a lot of inappropriate language, okay? But it's also straight up. And it's the experiences of many, many, uh, you know, Black youth 20, 30 years ago. Actually, I would even say 15 years ago. And so, Kaylee, what was it like to dance to that song? What, what did you feel from that? Like, what was the message you felt as a dancer that you were portraying through your movements, even though we couldn't use the, the you know, other than the instrumental? Right, right. Yeah. Um, dancing to that song, it just it expressed the meaning and question in this project, which is why does racism exist and what changes can we make? And um, in the African American culture, rap is very popular and it's used to convey and express messages. It expresses life, topics, issues, just issues that are part of daily lives in general. And I think that the song changes is a societal. Um, commentary centered on the African-American community and the injustices they must encounter and face within their lives. And I also think that it, fo it focuses on subjects such as police brutality, racial profiling, po poverty, street violence, and the everyday life of African-Americans. And um, I truly believe that it provides a visual into the everyday life of African-Americans and expresses the idea that changes need to be made in our world to our minds our souls our hearts our eyes you know so 
even in the song, Tupac suggested that um, in order to um, solve these issues, we need to unite. We need to create changes. He said, I got love from my brother, but we can never go nowhere unless we share with each other. We got to start making changes, learn to see me as a brother instead of two distant strangers. And as a dancer and a person who identifies with Black ancestry, the lyrics of this song allowed me to feel a variety of emotions. It allowed me to voice and express my opinions, my experience with racism from a very young child to now. And um, yeah, that's basically how it made me feel. Thank you so much, Kaylee. That was such an eloquent answer and you just taught me so much in your answer. Thank I wanna say so thank you so much. Wow. Thank you so much. I just much. almost wanna take a pause after that. that that's, that's straight up. Thank you so much, Kaylee, for sharing. And as you all know, um, we put it in the video, Lee's song um, was, was put in there for this live broadcast because we didn't want to break copyright and it fit perfectly, didn't it, Kaylee? It did, it did. It fit Hit the dance well. floor. <laughs> <laughs> Kaylee, Kay, Kaylee came into my classroom today and she's like, Miss Heron, that song fits perfectly. I said, I know God works in many ways, right? Like we just put the audio there and boom, it worked. It was great. Thanks, Kaylee. You're welcome. And I also want to thank Shaq's World, Shaq, for allowing Jamie and all the dancers to use your facility for the rehearsals and for the filming. I'm sorry to the dancers for interrupting your practice every now and then popping in, but uh, the music was too, it's too good to resist. <laughs> thank you so much. Shannon, how are you doing? I'm good. This is so inspiring. I'm so proud of these young people. Um, it's truly inspiring. And I know the future is going to be good if these guys are, are you know, doing what they're doing now. I know they can only go further. So yeah, this is great. It's great listening to them. And it was Jean Augustine who always said that our world is going to be inspired by the youth. I don't yes. remember exactly what she said, but it's all about the youth and she was really, you know, into, uh, promoted the power of education and mm -hmm. how our youth are going to, like, I love the quote, we rise by lifting others. They're going to lift us exactly. up into the next generation. Exactly. You got it. Yep. So what do you think, Shannon, that educators can do to better equip themselves and their students for a more diverse and inclusive future? Yeah, there's, I mean, just like everybody's been saying so far, um, there's so many different ways that educators can really continue to teach and connect with their students. Um, there's so many resources out there, particularly, you know, about Black Canadian history um, and just kind of thinking outside of the box. So, you know, using podcasts or blogs or video logs or poetry, dance, song, music whatever it is to connect um, to your students and, and really just get the message across, you know, if you're teaching about whatever you are teaching about concerning Black Canadian history, there's so many different resources and things that you can, you know, that educators can, can use, especially to talk about diversity and inclusion um, and not just teach Black Canadian history in February, but throughout the rest of the year, right? Black history is Canadian history. Um, it should be learned 365. And um, yeah, just up to educators to just really um, just be creative. There's so much out there to help them. I know sometimes there's that fear that, you know, they have to stick to the curriculum and stick to the lesson, but be creative, connect more with your students and um, just find ways to teach this uh, important history. Thank you so much, Shannon. Well said. You're welcome. Shaq, what do you think are the local, like what is our local community's needs right now from your perspective? What do you think we need more of in the Barry area? Um, we, so we kind of do this on a small scale here at Shaq's World and it's present, it's, it's providing pre representation to the underrepresented demographic here in Simcoe County. So I think a huge thing for Barry um, in particular is putting more people of color in power, in positions of power. Um, not only does that help 
with the self-esteem and the confidence of the next generation, seeing someone in that position that is reflective of who they are gives them the confidence to then go and strive for that. Um, so I think that in Barrie, we don't see enough representation in our education system, in our medical fields, or in our political structure here. So I think that that is a that's a great place to start and that's a great place to start conversations that can then go into the community and help build the community we're trying to trying to build moving forward. That's amazing. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Representation is so important so that people have something to look forward to, to know that they too can dream big and that there's going to be someone to have their back. Yeah, and I I'm just as a young woman that grew up here, as a young black woman that grew up here in uh, Simcoe County, it's very hard for me to, vis it was anyways, very hard for me to visualize myself as a lawyer or a teacher or anything of the, of the sorts. But I would like to see more people of color in those positions so that the next generation has that. Uh, path almost to follow right and those people to look up to so that's where that's I can hear lots of action happening in the background there's a lot of great stuff happening there tonight yeah it's kind of breaking my concentration but I'm I mean try my best but, I, but you're smiling you're happy because you know that they're playing ball you know <laughs> that they're having fun out there and it's great right yeah that's awesome that's awesome thank you Serena how are you I'm doing great. I'm like, my heart is so warm right now. I'm so happy. Ah, that's amazing. I love that. I love that. So you created and led, um, you led the St. Peter's podcast spelled P-A-W-D casts, yes. which was really cool on your yes. part, a really great idea. And you continue to be a voice for change. What would you like to see more in our school and greater community? So um, thank you for that question. Um, the podcast has meant so much to me from the beginning. I've used it as a tool to connect students, COVID included. It just felt like such a good idea to me at the beginning. And it felt so simplistic because the resources were me, my voice and a camera. And I chose a co-host that was completely different than me in personality. And so when Black History Month came along, this was like the perfect opportunity to use that resource because it connected everybody here and I'm so grateful for that. And I think the school community needs more trust. I mean, I believe that everyone here, especially for those younger than me in my school, um, I hope that they trusted me through this whole process. And then after February, we've got a lot more months to go until the end of school. So I hope they lean towards me. I hope that they can see me in the hallways asking for help and vice versa, which was the entire idea of the podcast at the beginning. And I think that those little things can always turn into something bigger. And this is it for me. I am so happy. Um, I mean, Nata and Sosa were saying that they felt that they were more comfortable because of me. And that's all I need. Um, our school environment is very important to me. I've stressed to everybody that I've talked to in my school that if you're making anyone feel that they shouldn't be there or they are not comfortable there, then there's something wrong because um, school, um, our city can be a home to many especially if they're not going home to somewhere where they can feel safe or comfortable. So I'm going to provide a place where they can come and say, you know what, at least I'm good for seven hours here. And I'm so happy that this is what we've created with that. And um, taking risks is something that I want to see more people doing. And I'm more than confident that after I leave, this will continue. And so Serena, I'm just going to bounce off what you, what you just, how you responded. When you were in grade nine and grade 10, did you have the same level of awareness as you do now as a grade 12 student and also two years of a pandemic? Um, well, I think anyone can say that's known me that I've always been loud. <laughs> I've, that's not changed. So I've always had an opinion. I've always wanted to be that person that people can come to. Um, but I think that confidence went from being like the follower to great ideas to now let me initiate. And um, that does take experience. So um, that's what I was saying, little risks, just if you start small, you will end up at a place where you can feel like you've just impacted so many people. Um, I wanna make people feel like they can inspire. So um, 
I hope that that's what I've done. And I know everybody is just, um, should be so proud of themselves. Absolutely. I'm very proud of you, Serena. Thank you. You're very welcome. Micah, how are you? Great, great. All calm, cool, collected. <laughs> I try, I try. I yeah, I always say Micah always keeps me calm. I'm 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 all hyper when we're trying to do the, you know, the editing and you say, it's okay. That's all I need is just a little calm, Micah. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. So you have always supported your father's work and you continue to do so today. So, and you're also a voice for change as well, whether you're working in front of the camera or behind, right behind the scenes. What would you like to see more of Micah in our community? So I really do like the work my dad does. Um, it's something that I actually, it took me a little bit to actually realize how fantastic it was because to me, he's just my dad. And you know, my dad just does his work stuff and I'm like, oh, that's cool. But hearing the impact it actually had on my friends and just the school atmosphere was something completely different. Because when he came in to perform in my school, I would have a bunch of friends just like, whoa, you know, like I never actually thought about it that way. So it's just a change in perspective, even in a school atmosphere and a home atmosphere and a friend atmosphere. It's just a completely new realization for a lot of people to be like, actually, I didn't actually 100% realize that I might have had this opinion about this or this slight bias, like, I had a few friends who actually came up to me after a Black History Month presentation my dad did. And they're like, I never actually thought about racism that way. I didn't think that it could be like that, even though maybe I just, I thought I just didn't get along with this person. But actually, I had a bit of bias just because I had some bad friends. So just kind of coming out of that, for me, I'm I'm on the lighter side of the melanin scale so not a lot of people always realize that I am black and I identify as a black person I love my black cuisine <laughs> um so a lot of people don't actually realize until they meet my dad they don't realize like oh wait you are actually black so I I get a bit of both sides of the coin some people are very nice and they give me the extra mile so I see a little bit of both of uh, the sides and my hope is that it just becomes one side, everyone's treated the same. Micah, I absolutely loved that. I loved your authenticity, the way you just opened up and your dad was smiling. He was just gleaming the whole time. You had everybody on this panel gleaming, Micah. That's beautiful, thank you. Aw, awesome. what a proud daddy moment, Errol. Aw, so Errol, speaking of that, you have five children. Yes. Five <laughs> children. I have known you since 2009. I remember when they were little babies. Yeah. And now I'm working with, he was eight years old when I met you. And now Mike <laughs> is helping me edit this project. I mean, where is the time going? Um, so your like, you continue, they inspire you, you inspire them. And how would you say they support you in this important work? Because you're a busy family. We are. And I mean, they're um, in a state of constant um, inspiration and support. I mean, they're all brilliant. You know, uh, everyone has something to offer to the work that I do. I mean, wow. If I were to have all of them in an event, which I have had before and I plan to do, I mean, man, there comes a time now that I could kind of chill and let them do a lot of what I've been doing. They're brilliant. And so I'm so thankful that they live the message that I share. You know, the, the idea is to um, teach, model, and nurture uh, because character is caught, right? More than it's taught. So that modeling part could even go before the teaching part. Model, teach, and nurture. You know, um, and I think that my wife and I have been always mindful of that. And we see this in our children. They're, they're amazing. Then. They're very talented, very gifted, very caring. They, they're really genuine people. 
And so we we're happy about that. And the interesting thing is, I see that with all of these young people here, to hear you guys, you're amazing. My goodness, the wisdom, the, the oh, I'm just so, I'm just happy, just listening. It's a beautiful. Errol, you are a very faithful family as well. And I think that you and your wife have to be very proud that you continue to stick together as a family as your kids are getting older. They're from grade nine and up. Yet you can all, it says a lot that you can all still work together. Yeah, we are, my wife and I, we're very much about our children. I mean, yeah, they mean the world to us and um, they should, right? And so everything that we think and plan we uh, for our future, we think about our, their children even and how we're going to keep them close, you know, so that we provide a space for them to always come home to and bring their children and that we can nurture their children like, you know, um, as great grandparents. We even are picking out our grandparents' name already. I'm Papa Lee. And my wife is uh, Granny Annie. <laughs> I love it. I love it. We're I all about it. our family. We were really family oriented, definitely. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that, Errol. You're welcome. <laughs> Aminata, how are you? I'm doing all right. Um, it's very interesting and fun to hear everyone's ideas and opinions. That's awesome. So what was your favorite podcast discussion and, and what do you think you, we need more of? Um, I think my favorite was when you we were talking about our favorite parts of our cultures. Um, it was really interesting. I think like mine was the music. It just like gets me going and um, it, it really comes from the heart, like how Errol said. Um, and also like just to um, put out there, like I feel People, when they hear Canadian Black history, they just hear slavery or um, how the slaves commuted from the U.S. to Canada. I just feel people need to know that Black history isn't all about that, like just about that. It's also like about Black inventors or resourceful Black people that were here way before slavery. Or, for example, there were kings and queens in Africa that were very rich and like they had a lot of riches so like I just want them to um, learn about all about all those stuff as well and um, the pr more pros and um, uh, more in, like better interesting stuff like other than the saddening and stuff about slavery and stuff. Thank you so much for that. Isyosa, how are you? I'm great. It's very good to hear what everyone has to say. It's very nice. It is, isn't it? It's it's like like Serena said, her heart is really warm. Um, it's it's great to feel that, right? It means it's it's real. It's real what we're talking about. So, what was your favorite part, Isyosa, of the podcast? Um, yeah, uh, I think. Well, I have a lot of favorite parts in the podcast. But I think um, when we all stated a word of how we felt about diversity and Black History Month, and I said acceptance because you feel Black History Month is the, celebra the celebration of people of color, of Black history, Canadian Black history, and you feel kind of that warm embrace, like I'm being appreciated, like I'm being noticed in a way. And it, it gives more of an open space and a comfortable zone. Like a lot of people come out and celebrate and it's just a time to celebrate your heritage. And I definitely feel like we need more celebration and it shouldn't only be just in the month of February because this is a part of Canadian history. And it's something that we definitely need to embrace and talk, uh, talk more of in schools. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. And you can share more favorite experiences if you want. Yeah. You said you have um, a whole bunch of podcasts. Don't be, yeah. don't be, don't be afraid to elaborate if you want. Also, with like what Aminata said when we talked about our favorite parts of culture, and I said, um, just like 
just learning about different cultures, their attire, the cuisine, just everything is just so wonderful about everyone's culture. And I'm definitely a person that likes learning about different cultures, their languages, trying to learn to speak the languages because it's something that's important to me. And I think it's important to get to know a culture other than your own. Absolutely. I agree with you. I 100%. That is what actually um, just broadens your whole thinking and it allows for less ignorance. And uh, I'm just going to throw a little shout out to my mom and dad if you're watching. And I'm sure all your parents are watching too, that when we used to go on trips, we didn't go to those all-inclusive resorts. Speaking of immersing in cultures, it was really important. Um, my father, my mother, they would always book we would stay right into the culture, right into the community, and we would eat within the culture. We would learn, we would dance within the culture. I just I became accustomed to that. And so for me, it was very eye-opening for me from a very young age. I think I was about grade seven, grade eight when we first started, you know, really traveling a lot as a family. And I believe to this day it has allowed me to be less ignorant. And be able to walk around and really connect with people from different cultures because I feel like I understand it a little bit more. So thank you for saying that, Isiosa. That's a really, really, really good point. And thanks, I, mom and dad. <laughs> I, I definitely relate to what you said. Like, after learning about different culture, cultures, my perspective on things is definitely has widened and opened a lot to learning about their beliefs, their religion, and the significance in a lot of things. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's what creates world peace. When there's a lack of understanding, there's conflict. You know, man to man, woman to woman, person to person. When you lack understanding, look what's going on in the world today around us. There's no communication, there's no understanding. We don't have the world peace and we got conflict. And that's not great for the youth to see either. So thank you so much. Madison, how are you? Still doing great. This is really great to like, you know, hear the discussion, especially um, in high school, a lot of students don't have these things in elementary school. So having it now is like really great. Oh, that's great. Thank you. So what was it like to be vulnerable during the song? And what message do you want people to, to, to hear from you? Well, obviously it was really nerve wracking. And me and Tiara were both trying to like make it good and stuff. Because um, not only is it about like having like a good song and good performance, but getting across Errol's message and how we're portraying it because everyone can interpret things differently. Um, but it's the message in the song and how I was seeing it and how I was trying to put it across is knowing that it's not just about accepting people for different colors, but fully embracing people's color and their culture. Um, and it helps us understand people better because just saying, oh, I accept you and I see you, but you're not really seeing someone. So the song is really about furthering that community. And I really hope that like, ex like for this whole um, thing, that that's what people are getting from it. Absolutely. Errol, do you want us to add something to that? Well, that was brilliant. I mean, that's, there really is not anything to add to that. That's exactly what I hope for, is that uh, we fully embrace people. We don't really accept people unless we really embrace them and who they are, their ideas, and, you know, their heart, basically. And, um, that song, What is Color, is one of my favorites. I, I've sang that song how many times? Four times today in four different concerts. And each time I sing the song, I enjoy just hearing these lyrics that it took me a while to, to write because they had to be right because I wanted exactly what Madison said, is that for people not to just say, okay, I accept you. No, I embrace you, you know, and that's awesome. That's right on, respect. And the key yeah. word from that song too is ethnocultural harmony. Yes. Ethnocultural harmony. It's, yes. That's what we're talking about. Diverse voices unite. Yes. You know, it's funny with, um, I'll just say quickly, I believe that the human race is one race. You know, um, we're 99.9% .9 the same. We're 0.1% different. And the 0.1% is responsible for skin color, hair color, eye color. And you don't have to leave your home to see this difference. You know, especially if you're a part of um, the white community, you have brothers and sisters who have blonde hair, brunette hair, 
blue eyes, you know, brown eyes, right, right there in your family. That's the 0.1%. So we make such a big deal. We, we've caused so much problems over something so beautiful as the different shades of melanin in our skin, which is color, right? Just different shades of who we are, where we reflect in each other as human beings. And so what I wanted for that song is like, hey, let's really embrace each other as a one human multinational ethnocultural family. Like Canada is a multinational country, you know? Um, but to me, truthfully, I think racism, a 20th century word, it's, it's only recently that people started to use race, right? It's, it's almost a divisive word. But before we use tribe, tongue, language, kindred, right? To dis describe the one human family, right? Because we're not born as a human family, but we are 99.9% .9 the same, right? And so we have to, as we recognize our differences, we should also recognize our similarities. And Michelle Obama says, what we lose sight of when we separate ourselves along race line is how connected we are. We can't, we can't lose sight of that. We are connected. We are the human family. I am so happy that you just discussed all of that, Errol. That was, that's, it's a really important message to get across. Thank you. Thank you. Not only word choice, but yeah. Talk about how we're similar and not just how we're different. Obviously embrace the differences. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. differences. That's what makes the uniqueness of mankind. If everybody was the same, oh, how boring life would be. But again, embrace the similarities and that's how you get things done. Yeah. That's how you have a smile on your face. You know? I cry, you cry. I laugh, you laugh for a lot of the same reasons, right? And so these differences, we can get past them and embrace them in, and celebrate them. You know, uh, the uniqueness of you, even among people like you, right? Absolutely. We have to look at that too, because each and every one of us are unique with, even within our people group. And that's different. You know, and so there's a lot to celebrate, but let's celebrate too the things that we have in common that brings us together as human beings. Thank you, Errol. You're welcome. Tiara, I'm going to ask you the same question as I did Madison. What was it like to be vulnerable during the song and what message do you hope people get from that? Um, what it was like to be vulnerable during the song, um, it was very nerve wracking at first, but then once I saw like Mads and Jamie and they were all like very hype about it, it made me feel more comfortable in the setting to sing along with them. And a message that we wanted people to get from the song is like exactly what Errol and Madison said. It's not always just about our skin color, our race, it's beyond that. Um, we all bleed the same, we all breathe the same. Like, there's no difference besides our culture, which shouldn't change anything and how we view others or maybe even bias each other. Excellent answer, Tiara. I loved it. Thank you so much. No problem. Can I jump Fans, in and say one you? thing? Oh, Sorry, I'm just going to say, Nelson Mandela says, no one is born hating another person because of the color of their skin, their background, or their religion. And people must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love for love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. So let's throw love out there. Let's talk, you know, love is what we were born to do. It comes more naturally to us. And it takes more facial muscles to frown than it does to smile. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> yep, exactly. Thank you so much, Franz, how are you? I'm doing amazing, thank you. Oh, I love all these words, this is amazing. We're all doing so well, I love it. So what do you think that our school community particularly at St. Peter's, can do to better meet the needs for diversity and equity? Um, well, I personally think that it's very important to talk about the importance of diversity. And I think that being open-minded to others' cultures and traditions is definitely a great way to start. I mean, not only, but it's really important to continue educating everyone about other cultures, especially um, Canadian Black history. And, you know, have them be aware of why it needs to be talked about consistently. Uh, like, we celebrate Black History Month, but we don't actually take the time to 
um, have classes discuss about it. And I think that group interaction is definitely, definitely needed so that, you know, students not only hear from one ear and out the other, but actually listen and thoroughly understand what it is they're learning. Yeah, I love that comment. That is so true. And I think that it is changing. It is definitely changing and people are hungry for that change. Particularly, I can speak on behalf of many educators that I speak to on a regular basis. They just feel that they need that support because of course, nobody wants to say or do the wrong thing. I know myself in my past, I've been teaching 22 years. I know I've made mistakes, but I try to forgive myself and try to learn from them and move forward because I, again, I'll repeat this again. This is hard work, but it's also hard work um, because you're pushing barriers. You're pushing people's bias and people are really comfortable in that. Oh, I got it all under control. I got my bias, which is usually from a young age. They learn it from a young age. So it's really hard to break down those barriers. But once you just slowly take them apart, you really see a, a, a true human soul. And then you realize that hatred isn't really, like Daryl said, the first feeling. It's easier to love. It takes a lot of work to hate. So thank you for saying that, Franz. Kaylee, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I'm really enjoying this conversation. It's very inspiring. That's awesome. So what I'm going to ask you the same question as I did, Franz, because we are slowly wrapping up tonight. What do you think our school community can do better to meet the needs toward diversity and equity? Yeah, so um, from a very young age, I chose to take on the role to advocate for racial discrimination. I find it disturbing that the education system refuses to take the time to educate students on the darkness associated with racism and how it affects people of color. Um, and it's not even just the conditions of slavery that needs to be speak spoken about, just as Aminata, Aminata sorry, was saying, um, Black historical, historical figures, um, culture, various cultures, clothing, um, achievements, just things like that are really important. And um, it's kind of like opening and closing a book. If you think about it, you only open it when you think you need to learn something. And that book needs to, con it just, it needs to stay open. It, 365 days of the year, it needs to stay open. Racism is not something that should be discussed only in the month of February. It has to be all year, all year round. And um, as for what schools can uh, do, um, I think there needs to be more diversity in schools, more um, educators from different backgrounds and changes to the curriculum are key to creating change within um, schools, um, focusing on like black history. Yeah, and I will admit to you, I'll just share a quick story. Um, when I was young, I grew up in Toronto and it was very diverse, but I'm not gonna do city comparisons because that's not what this is all about. But coming up to Barrie at age 10, as a young white woman, young girl at the time, I was 10 years old, I noticed it. I noticed it. And I immediately connected with people of different cultures instantly, or whoever was gonna you know, open up to me and share their culture with me. And, um, but I've definitely 22 years now of teaching have noticed very changing. And like I said before, there is this hunger now, there is this readiness that wasn't there before, at least in my opinion. And I see some nods, so that that makes me feel better knowing I'm not the only one, you know, that has observed that. So, um, and it's going to be slow, and it's not going to be easy, but at least it's happening. And I believe conversations will create the change and impact, and you have to have them. And as Shaq has said to me before, you're going to have uncomfortable conversations, right? And that's how progress happens. And uh, so thank you, everybody. Serena, I have a final question for you before we kind of come to a close. How do you see those of your generation as change makers toward understanding their past and creating a more diverse and equitable future? Sure. Um, I think I'm a bit biased because I'm a part of the generation. I love my generation. I think that when I was um, kind of starting all of this and learning more about my culture, I was like, I need to be somebody that I needed when I was younger. Coming here at a young age, I really needed somebody and reflecting on what Kaylee said, I had um, one teacher growing up um, in Innisfilberry Berry that was a person of color and I heavily relied on that teacher to feel safe in my school. So um, in doing all of this, I want to have like 
young Serena be like, oh, okay, I could have came to her. And I'm so happy that I see that in everybody here. Um, in terms of my generation, we like to push buttons. I think any parents watching, even Errol, um, the number one thing I say to my parents, why not? Why? Why? Like, I'm always testing them. I'm so sorry, mom and dad, but I, I really do like to push as much as I can. Um, I like to make any environment I'm in different, as different as I can make it, um, as uncomfortable as I can make it. But for the best reasons, um, I think that we don't like to stick to the status quo at all. And um, through learning different cultures, we've been talking about it. Um, I think that there's always the idea that what we do regularly is the right or normal way. And um, although maybe I wouldn't eat this or I wouldn't dress like this or whatever the case may be, I completely respect what anybody finds comfortable, what anybody does on a regular basis. And they may think, what are they wearing? What are they doing to myself? So that's what I've instilled in my brain um, while learning cultures, because that's the only way to keep an open mind. And I think that is a strength that I have and that others in my generation have. So I hope that that can continue with the ripple effect of other generations. And um, I hope the con conversation can continue as well. That was an excellent answer. Thank you so much. So we are wrapping up slowly. We still definitely have a few minutes. And again, I just want to thank all of the viewers. We have about, you know, seven, eight minutes to go. And I just thought I would open up the discussion um, and then I'll, I'll know when we're kind of coming to a close and I'll make sure that we all get those last words in. Serena, was there any questions that you wanted to ask, like an etching question as the video producer? I have so many questions for so many different people. Um, so I think I'm going to go off of who I've maybe talked to not as much. So Errol, I just, I love all your facial expressions. I've wanted to say something to you. Um, <laughs> watching you perform does something to me. I'm not the performer. I'm more like the, I'm so inspired by this. I love this dance. I love this singing. So watching you definitely did that for me. And I wanted to know if there was Thank anyone you. that inspired you to wow. kind of you. Oh man. First of all, thank you for saying that. And I think you're brilliant. I've heard you speak even last year. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> so that just thank you very much for saying that. I would immediately go to, okay, I kind of grew up on Michael Jackson and Prince. Those two performers, um, they were pretty positive. Like Michael Jackson is like, he really cared, you know? Heal the world. You know what I mean? Um, and Prince wrote a lot of songs too, like Signs of the Time. And I'm that kind of guy. I'm, I'm drawn to that kind of messaging. So those guys provided for me, they provided the singing and the dancing, amazing performers, right? Amazing everything. But then they provided the message. And so those two performers... Uh, I definitely, and, and also, I gotta say, Elvis Presley. Those are my guys. Elvis Presley, Prince, Michael, those are my guys. Yeah. Thank you. I honestly, secret, I just wanted to know if I was right, because I was like, I, I feel <laughs> inspiration coming from this <laughs> that I love listening to, and he's like, really embodying them, and I, I just, oh, now I know right, so. <laughs> oh man, it just shows the power of, of music, right? To to the heart and mind. And definitely, those guys definitely help to shape who I am. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for asking that. No problem. Thanks so much, Serena. Shannon, is there anything else that you'd like to ask anybody? Oh, um, so many thoughts. I don't know who to choose. Um Maybe, maybe Serena and Kaylee, um, future, future plans um, after high school, um, continuing this work. Um, do you see yourself continuing it? I hope you'll say yes, I'm sure. Um, yeah, and just future plans um, after high school. Uh, maybe Serena, or, or yeah. <laughs> no problem. Um... So right now I'm in the process of just hearing back from schools. I've applied to schools in the States. Ms. Heron has been 
an amazing help with um, writing different things for me. And so thank you so much, Ms. Aaron. Um, and school's here as well. I'm going into medicine and um, a little bit of engineering. <laughs> we'll see about that, but I've applied and now I'm just waiting to hear back. Um, in terms of implementing my values into my education, um, my whole family knows that I gave them a survey when I started looking for schools. I said, costs, um, who's going to make me feel like this environment is going to benefit me? Where am I going to prosper? Um, what is their ratio? Like when I talk to schools, because um, I've been interviewed by some schools in the States as well, I say, um, how do you feel at the school? How do you feel that you've been um, acknowledged, um, especially people of color that went there? So that's a priority for me and I plan to continue. Awesome, awesome. Kaylee, I am so sorry. We are wrapping Hello. up. Do you want to say something super fast, hon? I'm so sorry. Sure, it's all right. No, um, I just wanted to say I'll be continuing this work for the rest of my life. Just I want to keep going with it for the rest of my life. And in terms of uh, my plans after school, I want to go into medicine as well. Hopefully, um, yeah, I'm just uh, waiting for answers back from the universities at the moment. But yeah, that's it. Awesome, Thank you. Awesome, Thank you so awesome. much, Kaylee. Shak Yava. Quick last words here before we go. First of all, incredible. I, lo I love to see it. BIPOC doctors, love to see it, guys. Love to see it. Um, but I, I would just leave the audience with a challenge. Um, I try my best to, whenever I encounter any of the youth that I'm working with or even a new individual, I search for their superpower. Every single person has a superpower. Every single person has a light. Try your best when you meet someone new, regardless of what they may appear like, look for their superpower, find what makes them special and try to try to illuminate that. So race is an interesting topic, but if you meet someone, find their superpower. I, it's Thank challenge. you so much, Shaq. Shannon, last minute words. Oh, there's so much, but I know we're running out of time. Keep learning Black history, 365. Uh, Black people in this country, as I've said, we've been here over 400 years, and we have so many amazing stories and history, and we're resilient and courageous and powerful, and we remain hopeful um, despite the barriers and the challenges and the racism that we face. We keep going, and we, 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 we remain hopeful. So please keep that in mind, keep learning, keep growing. I'm so uh, privileged to be on this um, program with all of you guys. You guys are very inspiring. So keep up the great Thanks work. Thanks so much, Shannon. All right, Serena, then Errol. Quick thoughts, last minute if you want to. I'm going really fast. Thank you guys so much. Um, I cannot have done this without every single one of you. Uh, making the video, <laughs> so fast. Um, seeing the video visually in front of me, I know any one of you taken out would have completely changed it. So you guys are all a puzzle piece to this and I'm so grateful to work with every single one of you. Errol, can you do five seconds or less? I'm just so, so proud of everyone here. That's it. I'm Thank really you. proud of you. All right, everybody. Um, I love you all. We've come to the end of our discussion. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts and ideas. Without conversations, learning does not happen. Thank you for joining us. And special thank you to the Catholic School Board, the City of Barrie, and Rogers Television. Stay tuned for 2023, everyone. It's going to be live in person for schools and the community. Until next time, stay safe. And remember, diverse voices unite. Thank you.